Hi, welcome to day three, and today our theme is Voyages of Discovery. Now, so far we've been focusing on the prehistoric and classical era. Uh, we're skipping ahead a fair bit through the Middle Ages to that point where Europe starts to explore and expand. Uh, this is, from a European perspective, economically wonderful because they get access to things which are available throughout the, uh, the world. And for those whose uh, resources that they're exploiting, uh, not so good a thing. Uh, this is the beginning of the Imperial Age, the uh, age of col colonialism and colonization, um, and um, the beginnings of the modern world. So it's important for us to know that what we're talking about here now is the um, uh, question of how our current world, the so-called industrialized world, the world which is divided into developed and undeveloped nations and so forth, how this came to be. This is where we start to get very... Um, uh, both political but also relevant. Now, how is it that the colonial world got started? You may think it has something to do with um, uh, mining or food production and so forth. And you'd be generally right, but the most important thing was spices. Now, spices came some distance to get to Europe. And um, when they got there, they were regarded as uh, essential luxury items. That is to say, they weren't something that you needed to live. They were something you needed to live well. Spices typically came from um, uh, Southeast uh, Asia, um, the Indonesian archipelago, uh, India, um, to a lesser extent, places like China and so forth. But what really made a big difference was Columbus's voyage to the Americas in 1492. Now, he was motivated largely by finding a route to India via the ocean. He didn't know of the New World. And he thought that he had reached India because the islands in the Caribbean uh, had um, uh, chili peppers, which um, were Indian. Uh, sorry, so the true pepper, which was Indian. But um, Columbus didn't realize that uh, uh, this was a different spice, a new spice. Columbus's voyage began what the historian Alfred Crosby has called the Columbian Exchange, a vast exchange of plants, animals, people and diseases between the old world and the new. I'll return to this. Our spice cabinets today are a reflection of a globalised world that really only began to emerge in the late 15th century. And it was the um, quest for spice that was the foundation of um, uh, globalisation. Right. So why were spices important? According to historian Paul Friedman, the idea that spices were used in Europe to preserve food was a myth. Indeed, smoking, pickling and salting were and still are perfectly good alternatives to refrigeration, which of course at that time did not exist. Some spices have been shown to have antibacterial actions, but certainly not all. And in any case, spices were more expensive than the meat they were supposed to preserve. So if they're not used for preservation, what were they used for? Well, according to Friedman, most spices used in cooking began as medical ingredients. And throughout the Middle Ages, spices were used as both medicines and condiments. Above all, Medical recipes involve the combination of medical and culinary law in order to balance food's humoral properties and prevent disease, he says. 
Now, this way of thinking had its origins in classic antiquity, particularly in the works of Hippocrates and Hippocratic writers of Greek antiquity and the Roman physician Galen. So according to the humoral, H-U-M-O-R-A-L theory, there were four fluids in the body. Phlegm, black bile, yellow bile, and blood. They represented um, the seasons, they represented organs, as you can see here in the diagram, and they represented the four elements. But most of all, they represented hot, cold, and damp and dry. And in order for you to have a um, balance in your life, uh, you needed to have a balance of these properties. So we still talk about somebody being sanguine, they have an excess of blood, which means that they're evenly tempered and uh, not easily stressed. Phlegmatic, which means you're practical and calculating. Uh, melancholic, well, you know what that means. That's uh, uh, literally black bile, melancholia, um, is uh, depression. And choleretic, which is not something we hear very much of these days, but it means having a sunny disposition. Okay, now these uh, four humours had to be kept in balance, and so all of these spices were used in order to reduce or increase the, um, uh, the, the different fluids. Now, it was about this time, uh, spices were not really understood where they came from. Before the 15th century, Europeans had almost no knowledge of anything past the Holy Land. Um, they had a vague idea that things came from India. Uh, they had a vague idea that um, uh, spices came from Arab traders, uh, but that's about it. Uh, and, and as far back as the 7th century, Europeans thought that pepper grew on trees that were guarded by serpents that would bite and poison anyone who attempted to gather the fruit. The only way to harvest pepper, they thought, was to burn trees which would drive the snakes underground. Freedom, Friedman has the uh, details. In fact, much of the manuscript of the travels of Marco Polo, which was written around about 1298, so we're talking around about two centuries before the uh, uh, voyage to the Americas, was dedicated to the description of spices and other goods of commercial and trade value. Trade, you're going to remember, Polo comes from uh, uh, Venice. Venice was a massive trading hub uh, at the time. Most of its wealth came from that. Illustrated manuscripts of the text, such as the one uh, housed in the French National Library, show scenes shown above, such as the pepper harvest, and notice that there are no strange snakes here. Marco Polo also described the flavour of sesame oil in Afghanistan. He reported that the wealthy in Karazan ate meat pickled in salt and flavoured with spices, while the poor had to be content with hash steeped in garlic. Polo also described the abundance of cinnamon, pepper and ginger on the Malabar coast of India. So his sources were a major uh, um, addition to European knowledge. But knowledge generally of nature in the west of Europe, notice that I'm not talking about the east of Europe, I'll say why in a sec, um, was generally dominated by authorities in manuscripts that have been preserved since the uh, uh, classical period. Uh, and as Arist Aristotle was translated into um, um, into Latin so that they could be read by Western Europeans. Uh, his idea that there was a graduated scale of complexity from um, the vegetative soul that I spoke of last lecture through to the rational soul was developed into uh, what's now known as the great chain of being. And this is the idea that um, 
there was a scale, a ladder of complexity that things naturally went through, that nature wanted to become more complex because of its internal um, properties. Now, one of the things that was uh, added to the knowledge of classical antiquity was a book called the Historia Plantarum, or Inquiry on, on Plants. Now, that's the Latin title. Um, he called it um, Historia Plantis, I think, in, in Greek, by Aristotle student Theophrastus, who wrote the founding treatise of ancient botany and pharmacology. In that book, he talks about the use of plants, herbs, and to a degree, spices for medical purposes. Also, um, the Roman physician Galen, who was uh, second century of the Common Era, uh, published a book which was translated as On the Mixtures and Properties of Simple Medicines. And that meant that suddenly botany had a practical role. Also, during this period, we had um, what were called herbals. Now, there was no medical profession as such. Uh, so knowledge about nature and the uses of nature um, was uh, published uh, in manuscripts, because they had to be hand copied, um, about um, what herbs could be used for medical purposes. Um, the, the image here is from a 15th century herbal called the Codex Sloan. Uh, it's a uh, 15th century Italian parchment. And you'll notice that um, uh, it's got a demon that's being driven away from a plant. That plant is St. John's wort, which is something that people use today even for antidepressants. It was also believed in the Middle Ages, and I guess for the same reason, as to be effective at driving away evil spirits. Now, between the 14th and 16th centuries, uh, these herbals, which were largely written for the use of wise women in villages, as well as uh, physicians in courts and the like, uh, they um, uh, slowly evolved into what we would call botanical treatises uh, through to the 16th century. And what's really interesting is that they had um, identification guides in the form of uh, drawings. Now, the problem with having um, illustrations of plants in a manuscript is that the next person who comes along is likely to simplify the diagram. So that after a few generations of a, of a, um, a herbal, without uh, somebody going out and gathering specimens so that they could be redrawn, uh, they became very uh, unreliable. Uh, this changed in the uh, uh, Gutenberg era when they started to use woodcuts to uh, do at least uh, black and white, or brown and white, depending on the ink, um, uh, prints of these things, uh, uh, of these plants, which were then hand colored. So most of what the Western Europeans knew about uh, the world prior to the Renaissance was based on the works of a, a Greco-Roman astronomer and geographer Claudius Ptolemy from the second century CE. And what you're looking at here is a 15th century depiction of what it was that Ptolemy talked about. And you can see that it's basically uh, North Africa, Europe uh, below, well, at least below the Arctic Circle, uh, all the way to what we would think of as Central Asia and India. Um, and then because they didn't know what was going on in the Indian Ocean, they basically just rounded the continent around uh, so that it joined up back with Africa. Nevertheless, um, there was a fair bit of information known about this region. But let's call this the classical region. When uh, people started to um, travel for trade, um, they needed roadmaps, and the ro uh, existing 
uh, maps were not terribly useful. So um, in particular in Portugal and um, uh, Spain, beginning in the 13th century, but really taking uh, wing, so to speak, in the 14th, uh, was a type of map called a Portaland map. Um, and um, this was eventually published as an atlas so that each main point had directions to get to somewhere else in a straight line. All you had to do was follow the compass. Um, now, this one shows the um, uh, uh, Pontus, the, the uh, gap between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, uh, down in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, on the north side there is where uh, Constantinople was, and that eventually, of course, became Istanbul. And uh, in fact, most of these maps used an eastern uh, orientation rather than a northern. So uh, when you're looking at these things, sometimes they can be a little bit hard to interpret straight up. So this was in effect a road map for traders. Prior to that, they'd been relying on written itineraries, uh, going back as far as the uh, coastal pilots of the classical world. But now they could travel out over uh, large bodies of water and uh, without needing to see the coast. Now, I've talked about the Western Europeans. The Eastern Europeans did read Greek. Consequently, such manuscripts that had been kept from the uh, classical world had um, been maintained in the intellectual life of uh, the Eastern uh, Christian um, Europeans. Um, the, the remnants of the Roman Empire on, in the East. Uh, and they had a much better idea of what was out there than the, the uh, Western Europeans. Uh, so you have to be a bit careful when you're thinking uh, about this, that you focus on the West, not the East, as the place where they needed to learn about the world in order to trade for it, through it. All right. Let's look very, very briefly at some early Euro West European voyages of discovery and their impact on the world. Um, this, is a whole, uh, this course is a history of nature, not a history of European colonialism. Um, so the voyages of discovery, about which entire courses are taught, um, we only need some uh, a brief review of the fra facts as a framework. Too much detail will distract from our purpose. So the beginnings were small. For nearly a century, Iberian seafarers, that's Portuguese and, and uh, uh, Spanish and um, uh, Catalan and, and what have you, seafarers explored the Atlantic islands close to Africa and the Portuguese crept down the west coast of that continent. Then, during a third of a century, starting in 1492, mariners sponsored by the Spanish and Portuguese uh, monarchs set out on long distance voyages. The Spanish went looking for an alternative and more direct route to spices and the other treasures of the Indies. The Portuguese first looked for gold in West Africa. Their search led them gradually to the carriers and sources of the spice trade, motivated in part because the fall of uh, the Byzantine Empire, that is the Eastern um, um, uh, Christian part of Europe, uh, to the Ottomans had made access to land routes to the East very difficult. Um, there are three major voyages which we can consider true watersheds. The voyages of Christopher Columbus to the Americas and several subsequent ones, particularly Amerigo Vespucci, for, after whom the Americas are named, and the voyage of Vasco da Gama around the Cape of Good Hope, uh, which is uh, shown here. Um, and Vasco da Gama found a way to get to India uh, in 1497. But finally, we have the circumnavigation of the globe by Magellan's fleet from 1519 to 1522. Magellan died the year before they returned after conflict in the Philippines, but his uh, captains managed to uh, continue the rest of the voyage back to Europe. Now, you often hear that people in the med medieval era thought that the world was flat. <laughs> 
This is not the case. Nobody thought the world was flat, apart from a couple of very literal-minded biblical writers in the early um, medieval, late classical period. But what Magellan showed was that um, while the Earth is um, round, everybody knew that there was, in fact, a way to get around the Earth. Um, Sebastian Cabot had tried to um, find a northwest passage through to uh, Japan, China and India uh, in 1497. Didn't get very far because there is no northwest passage. Well, there is now, but there wasn't at the time. And so um, um, it wasn't the English or the French who started these uh, imperial um, investigations and, and colonizations, it was the Spanish and the Portuguese. Now, before these voyages, Europe was a backwater compared to the powers of the Muslim world, India and China. But these voyages led the world to an era where the balance of world power and wealth would shift dramatically from Asia and the Middle East to Europe. Uh, one thing about this map that I've got up here uh, you'll see there are two vertical lines. Uh, the one on the right was the line of demarcation between what the uh, Pope said that the Portuguese could have and what the Pope said that the Spanish could have. Um, the next year there was a treaty between Spain and Portugal which gave the Portuguese um, uh, what is now known as Brazil um, and uh, the Spanish uh, basically had most of the Americas and uh, the Philippines. It didn't last for long, of course, but uh, uh, at least there was some semblance of uh, an agreement. By the late 1600s, they'd been displaced in many regions by the English, the French and the Dutch, generally after some brutal and bloody wars. And the resulting era of European colonial expansion is fascinating and so vast that we would need several courses to be able to uh, uh, cover it. From the perspective of this course, though, it's not so much the chronological and political aspects of this history that interest us, but rather how these voyages and explorations changed our ideas about nature and our relationship to the natural world. So by the mid 1500s, the world was for the first time ever truly global. A hundred years after Magellan, Francesco Carletti was a Florentine merchant who set out from Seville in Spain in 1594 on a slave trading expedition which turned into a round-the-world tour, in his own words, partly out of curiosity to see the world and partly because of our interest in business. In other words, that's the first bit of uh, commercial tourism. <laughs> well, there's Marco Polo, but we're still debating how far he actually went. But what's interesting about Carletti's uh, trip is that he did it on annually scheduled merchantmen. This was not an exploration. There were already trading routes between every place that he got to and the next one. So he went from Spain to Mexico from Acapulco to Manila, from Manila to Japan, and from Japan to Macau. From Macau, he went to Goa, and then aboard a Portuguese ship back to Lisbon. It took four years. But the point is, exchanges flourished across the Pacific as well as across the Atlantic. The Manila galleons carried silver to the Philippines, most of which ended up in China. In return, silk arrived in America. In Lima and Mexico City, uh, women wore Chinese silk. The inhabitants of the Muslim world were tied to the new global network as both consumers of silver arriving by way of Europe from America and as middlemen speeding its transfer across the Indian Ocean to China. And it's particularly fitting that Garcilaso de la Vega, offspring of a Spanish conquistador, and an Inca princess should have made the comment in 1609, summing up the results of the oceanic voyages just discussed, there is only one world. So, from the old world, we received an exchange of ideas, 
food crops, populations and diseases. The old world, by which we mean not just Europe, but the entire Eastern Hemisphere, that is um, Europe, Asia and Africa, um, came from the Colombian exchange in a number of ways, including new staple crops such as potatoes, sweet potatoes, maize, cassava, less calorie intensive foods such as tomatoes, chili peppers, cacao, peanuts and pineapples were also introduced and are now culinary staples in many national cuisines from Italy to Malaysia and Thailand. Tobacco, another new world crop, was so universally adopted that it came to be used as a uh, substitute for currency in many parts of the world. The exchange also drastically increased the availability of many old world crops such as sugar and coffee, which were particularly suited to the soils of the New World. The exchange not only brought gains, though, but also terrible losses. European contact enabled the transmission of diseases to previously isolated communities, and the devastation far exceeded even that of the Black Death in the 14th century for the, local, um, for the natives. Europeans brought deadly viruses and bacteria such as smallpox, measles, typhus and cholera for which Native Americans had no immunity. Now, just a quick side comment here. By immunity, I mean that the people had not um, had time to evolve genes which would provide some sort of... Um, um, protection against the diseases. Um, the genes involved in the Black Death, uh, most of the survivors had a gene which itself had uh, been around for some time already, uh, which prevented um, them from being easily infected. And if they were infected, they weren't infected badly. Uh, so that's um, an immune educated population uh, don't think that just being um, exposed to uh, a, uh, a disease is enough to give a population immunity. What happened in this case was that um, uh, European populations, sorry, the, the, the indigenous populations in the Americas um, uh, were unable to fight off diseases and uh, it ended, uh, caused a massive population crash, sometimes deliberately. Uh, on their return home, though, European sailors brought syphilis to Europe. Uh, this was a disease that um, in the Indian populations, American Indian populations, caused facial scarring, but not much else, uh, under the name of yours, Y-A-W-S. So... <laughs> There's a lot of debate about how many people died. Um, estimates of the population on the arrival of the first Europeans range from 20 million to 80 million or more. I tend to go for the higher number. Uh, they were um, moderately complex societies and I think you need high, high population numbers for that. Um, but what we don't debate is the effect that it had something on around of 90 uh, something on the order of about 90 percent of um, indigenous Americans died within a century of first contact um, <clears throat> the other thing is that these diseases were very often taken to the new world deliberately to infect the natives I'll come back to that down the track. Uh, here's a quote that Crosby makes that I quite like, the seams of Pangaea. Now, Pangaea is, or Pangaea, is the um, single continent from which the current continental plates uh, diverged. Um, there was a point at which it was just one continent on the planet. Um, the seams of Pangaea were closing, drawn together by the sailmaker's needle. Chickens met kiwis, cat cattle met kangaroos, 
Irish met potatoes, Comanches met horses, Incas met smallpox, all for the first time. On a slightly more light-hearted note, one of the more quirky elements of the Colombian exchange is the hammock, which Spanish conquistadors came across in the West Indies and which had become standard on European naval ships by 1600. Uh, this engraving from about 1630 uh, shows uh, Columbus, I believe, or uh, Amerigo Vespucci, um, and uh, the woman the figure in the hammock represents America. In, um, so, yes, there's uh, all sorts of things that are um, uh, enter into the European consciousness at that time. Now. One thing that entered into the European consciousness is the slave trade. I've mentioned it before, we need to here as well. The population movement from the old world to the new world was in many cases done in brutal conditions in the Atlantic slave trade. This is a map showing the millions of Africans transported as slaves in the period between 1500 and 1888. Um, largely to the New World, but notice the thriving trade around North Africa, the Middle East, and the Indian Ocean as well, where slave trading had existed prior to European colonization. Also note that the bulk of New World slaves were sent to the Caribbean and South America, and not to the Americas, um, uh, not to uh, the United States. <clears throat> uh, present day ethnic blending in those countries reflects this. Of course, we often think slavery ended with the abolition um, of slavery in the Americas, uh, the last country there being Brazil in 1888, but it didn't. Some African and Middle Eastern countries only abolished slavery in the latter part of the 20th century, and at least one African country, Mauritania, only in 2007, where, despite this, it is estimated several hundred thousand people still live in slavery. Uh, in in particular, there is a form of forced labour that is going on through the Middle East and South Asia, but um, that's for a different class, and I think uh, we can skip over it right at the moment. Right, so here's that map. Um, uh, sorry, here's the, a, a map of what the Europeans knew at the end of that period, uh, the, the Renaissance, and uh, uh, as you can see, they're pretty good with latitude, not very good with longitude. And look, re you know, in the United States, there is unreasonably wide. Uh, partly the reason is there was no simple way to uh, determine what your longitude was, um, whereas there was an accurate way of determining latitude. So it took a while before the Americas uh, were properly mapped. And as you can see, um, what they know of Australia is um, basically the Gulf of Carpentaria uh, and the rest is thought to have been contiguous with uh, Antarctica. Despite the revolution in cartography, medieval and Renaissance perceptions of the world, and particularly those little known parts of the world, the open seas and faraway lands, continued to be influenced by mythology. Folklore and exaggerated travels, tales and fantasy were rife. Many maps of the world or parts of it featured incredible sea monsters. Um, during the Middle Ages, you'd often see uh, Hic Draco Sunt, and here be dragons, uh, on land masses. Uh, here we've got a sea monster attacking a ship off the coast of India in Abraham Hortelius's 1571 Theatrum Orbis at Terrarum. Now, uh, that looks to me like a very bad drawing of a whale, and I suspect um, that's what it was. The whales occasionally would um, hit uh, ships, particularly whaling ships, uh, and those stories ended up getting back to the map makers, but without um, reliable descriptions. Okay, so that's what they knew at this time. Early voyages of discovery were primarily mercantile, but the knowledge they brought back uh, had 
serious scientific value and of course knowledge is power while the history of voyages of discovery with a specific scientific mission often begin with the voyage of captain cook are often thought to begin with the voyage of captain cook i want to turn my attention now to an often overlooked voyage made by a most remarkable woman maria sabella marianne she was born 13 years after the trial of galileo to a wealthy family of publishers and engravers from whom she learned the art. In June of 1699, just on the edge of the 18th century, at the age of 52, she departed on a cargo ship for South America's Suriname, a Dutch colony, with only her 22-year-old daughter, Dorothea Maria, for company. This is like a hundred years before Alexander von Humboldt's more famous travels. We'll cover those in a later lecture. And certainly not an era in which many German women worked outside the home, let alone went on solo natural history expeditions. To fund her trip to Suriname, the divorced single mother sold 255 of her own paintings to outfit herself and her young daughter. Marion was interested in one thing, butterflies. Not just their beauty as adults, but their whole life cycle, from caterpillar to winged insect. In fact, this is certainly one of the earliest voyages, possibly the earliest, with an entirely scientific purpose. And she published in 1679 her Caterpillars, Their Wondrous Transformations and Peculiar Nourishment from Flowers in vernacular German, and in 1705, she reported on the Suriname um, insects uh, with um, Metamorphosis Insectorum Surinamensum. There is a 2007 biography, uh, bibliography, bibliography, biography of Marion by Kim Todd, if you want to follow this up. She claims um, uh, that based on the fact that virtually everyone who came before conducted investigations as a sideline to some other work, usually soldier, surgeon, doctor, or pirate, uh, this was indeed the first scientific voyage. Uh, it's, it's called A Butterfly Journey, Maria Sibylla Marion. Now, her style of art is very influential on later Botanic art artists. And scientists like Linnaeus used her work to name about a dozen species, but most scholarly work doing uh, regarding her has been from the perspective of art history. Until very recently, her work has largely been overlooked by historians of science, and this is unfortunate because she was the first botanical artist to depict each insect with a host plant. And prior to Marion, flora and fauna appeared separately for the most part, and few connections were drawn to other organisms in either the text or the image. One image in particular, as well as its accompanying text, that's the one on the left, has been cited as being of great significance. The image is shown here. It features spiders battling ants, a depiction of, a depiction of leafcutter ants, and a spider that has killed a hummingbird in the branches of a guava tree. According to Kay Etheridge, uh, Marion was the first to elucidate through word and art what we now think of as food chains and interactions with ecological communities. On the right hand side there we have uh, uh, an, an image of, uh, I think that's bananas. I think that's bananas, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but you can see the, the, the beauty of the work as well as the um, um, amazing accuracy, the uh, realism of what she's doing. All right. So, as Europeans spread out, they encountered a lot of things that had not been known. They also encountered things that had been known in better detail. The great apes, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, uh, were completely unknown until the 1600s. In fact, they would continue to exert a powerful influence on the popular and scientific imagination and thinking well into the 19th century. 
Shown here is a plaster presented by French artist Emmanuel Fremier to the French Salon Jury in 1859, which is the same year that Darwin had published on The Origin of Species and that Boucher de Perthes' stone tools were recognised as authentic. In his own words, he wrote, At a time when a lot of noise was made about mankind and apes being brothers, it was an audacious idea, and my work proved even more aggravating since the gorilla being the ugliest of all primates, the comparison was hardly flattering for humans. With great recklessness, this gorilla was dragging off a young woman. Since the young woman in question was a negress, I thought my gorilla might pass. This was not to be. The jury's condemnation was unanimous. My work was declared to be seriously offensive to public morality, and it was banished pitilessly from the salon. Now, Obviously, the words show the kind of racism inherent at the time, but interestingly, Fremier, who became a highly successful artist, would continue the theme for many years in later pieces, with the women becoming visibly European. And of course, we can recognise it in the later uh, film, King Kong. But in the early 1600s, all of this was yet to come. One of the first accounts of um, uh, the Great Ape comes from Andrew Battelle, an English sailor and traveller in his strange um, adventures. His account of a long stay in Portuguese captivity in Angola and his travels in the region were published in 1614 and they're an essential primary source for the history of that reason, region. It also mentions two kind of monsters probably the gorilla and the chimpanzee, including the fact that they were known to kill and carry off natives. Now, Battelle's descriptions are typical of traveller's tales. They're at least partially based on a fact, though, and he may never have seen either of the animals himself. They did, however, fuel speculation at home. A more reliable report of a great ape came from the Dutch physician Jacobus Bontius, uh, who was working in Java between 1628 and 1631. He reported that the local name for the wild apes on the island was Urang Utang, or Man of the Forest. His depiction, on the other hand, is wildly exaggerated, with exa uh, inaccurate, with exaggerated human female-like uh, characteristics and a lion-like mane. It wasn't, however, until um, uh, 15 years later when the first live chimpanzee arrived in Europe as a gift for the Prince of Orange, who kept it in a menagerie in Amsterdam. Nicholas Tulp, a professor of anatomy and surgery in Amsterdam, and you can see him uh, immortalised in Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson. Uh, to the right there, wrote a widely read essay, Homo Sylvestris Orangutan, after his dissection of the creature upon its death. Now, following Tulp, later writers used orangutan for any large ape from Africa or Southeast Asia. Homo Sylvestris, man of the forest, was also widely used, referring to the hairy half-wild human creatures living deep in European forests, according to folklore. The essay was part of a medical text popularly known as the Book of Monsters, both for the description of creatures brought back by the East India Company traders, but also for some of the brutal medical procedures uh, described in it. Tulp also produced a famous illustration of the creature in a strikingly thoughtful pose on the left there, which was frequently reproduced. In 1698, a live ape arrived in England and was put on display at a freak show in London. It attracted considerable attention, including that of the anatomist Edward Tyson. The infant chimpanzee, or bonobo, we're not sure which, died three months after arrival from an infectious wound contracted during the voyage and was meticulously, meticulously dissected by Tyson. He carefully compared the creature's anatomy to our own in his work Urang Utang Sive Homo Sylvestris, or The Anatomy of a Pygmy Compared with That of a Monkey, an Ape, and a Man, for which he is commonly called the father of comparative anatomy. Tyson envisaged the creature as a link between man and apes on the great chain of being. <laughs> 
It was important to note, though, that this was not evolutionary thinking because the chain of being was seen, was seen as unchanging in time. But the careful comparison was an important step. In the 18th century, Carl Linnaeus would classify humans in the order primatis, or primates, in his Systema Naturae. And this prompted a great, great deal of debate around the central question, how human were the great apes, pitting great naturalists like the Comte de Buffon against Linnaeus, and philosophers against, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau arguing for him. The French naturalist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck suggested that humans had transmuted from apes. Transmutation is a process of changing over time. This scandalous proposition was referred to by the great uh, geologist Charles Lyell as going the full orang in an 1859 letter to Thomas Huxley. These stages will be covered later, so I'll leave the great apes for now. However, I'll also briefly return to the subject of orangutans later in this lecture as I speak about the voyage of Alfred Russell Wallace, co-discoverer with Darwin of natural selection. All right, let's move on. I want to look at two uh, developments uh, in the rest of the lecture. Um, the first being the um, development of uh, natural history collections and museums, and the second being classification and collection of um, specimens. Now, this is directly relevant to this period and in, connected intimately to the voyages of discovery, and it will have quite an impact on how we think of nature over the uh, subsequent history. In the 16th century, um, the development of large private collections, gardens, and what were called cabinets of curiosity uh, became commonplace as status symbols among rulers and the wealthy classes, and many later museums are based around these collections. For example, the Sir Hans Sloan collection was a founding part of the British Museum. Uh, here you can see some paintings of the sorts of things that you might find in cabinets. Uh, they're often hodgepodges of items including minerals, taxidermic animals, fossils, corals, man-made devices such as scientific interests. The British Museum originated in the 18th century and Hans Sloan, when he died in 1753, set up his will to ask the British Parliament to buy his collection for £20,000, not in considerable amount of money at the time, and set up a public museum that anybody, whether they were British or from outside Britain, would be able to enter free of charge. I can attest to the fact that it is free to get into the British Museum, even for Australians. Of course, what they had in mind was mainly dignitaries and foreign scholars from other parts of Europe. For several decades, there were quite a few curators who were not comfortable with the idea that anyone could look at the collections and study them. Curators didn't like the idea that lower orders of society were going to come in and get their hands on the collections. They had a great deal of class anxiety and believed learning was a genteel privilege. It took a long time into the 19th and even the 20th century to accept that ordinary folk could learn natural history as well. <clears throat> Hans Sloan had been a slaver. Uh, he uh, went to Jamaica and spent almost a year and a half there working as a plantation doctor. Um, and his book, A Natural History of Jamaica, is almost entirely enabled by uh, slavery. When he came home, he married a Jamaican heiress, and so money comes into the family coffers from slave plantations. So you can see the connections. Uh, he has many correspondences throughout the Caribbean and West Africa. Slave traders send him specimens, and he collects clothing worn by slaves, nooses and whips used to punish and execute runaways. He had skin specimens, skull specimens, and he was part of this early scientific generation, already interested in trying to work out if there's a physical basis for racial differences. Here we go. 
Okay. Right. A particularly resilient and also simplistic narrative in the history of the sciences sees the rise of modern botany out of systems of classification. And it is true that the 18th century saw major developments in classification systems in botany and other fields. Uh, it was never, however, just a pure science defined by taxonomic systems and plant descriptions. For those who don't know the word taxonomy, it's putting things in order. Right? Libraries have a taxonomy, uh, the, usually the Dewey Decibel system or something like that. Plants and botany, as we started out with this lecture, were a driving force behind uh, European colonialization and imperialism. It was big business and big science. Now, Linnaeus believed botany could increase national wealth. He wanted to stem the tide of wealth flowing to Asia by developing varieties of plants adapted to Nordic clients. Londa Schiebiger cites his own words in writing. He hoped that he could fool or tempt and train them to grow in Arctic lands and thereby create Lapland cinnamon groves, Baltic tea plantations and Finnish rice, rice paddies. He was certainly not alone in this. This was a general uh, um, project called uh, in the 19th century acclimatization. And the idea was that um, particularly with spices such as um, uh, cinnamon and, uh, and and so on, that these things could be grown in um, European climates so we, they didn't have to be um, brought in. <clears throat> oh, and I missed there that um, uh, it was also, uh, botany was also very big for uh, medicine, particularly quinine. At this time, we get what's called by Richard Hugh Grove uh, a nascent environmentalism. This is uh, partly as a result of the economic importance put on botanical and geographical knowledge that could benefit colonial powers. There is also uh, this movement. And I'll dedicate a lecture to, so I won't um, uh, go into great detail. Grove argues that information gathering institutions of the European empires made global patterns of environmental and climate change visible for the first time, and that plant transfers between colonies raised environmental awareness in imperial powers. I'm not sure to what extent this is uh, the case, but Grove has made the uh, argument. So, if the environmental could, uh, movement could begin, thanks to the voyages of discovery, why not the sexual revolution? In 1776, Louis Antoine Comte de Bougainville set off to circumnavigate the globe and became the first Frenchman to do so. And his descriptions of things that he encountered, particularly in Tahiti, uh, became a component of the romantic thinking of the 18th century philosophers. Uh, in particular, the liberation of sexual mores. Um, so um, these reports were strengthened by a set of Dennis Diderot's philosophical dialogues based on Bougainville's account that provided an argument in support of the belief that human nature was by default free from sexual mores and that these had been imposed by society and religion. Uh, to be clear, Diderot himself was not advocating a libertine existence and a return to the natural state. He was offering a critique of Western society in comparison with a state of nature that could not be regained. Nevertheless, according to Grove, this newly constructed sexuality was part of the same return to nature which underlay environmentalism. And of course, Tahiti and other Polynesian islands have considered to have this erotic, exotic resonance um, in Western Im uh, imagination and thought, from the works of Gauguin to the writings of uh, Margaret Mead. Ultimately, sex sells. So, um, let's move on to the 19th century before we get back to the uh, um, classification. Uh, 
There are a great many voyages in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, the, um, uh, Humboldt uh, is one. He moved, spent a lot of time in uh, Mexico, South America, and uh, uh, North America. Um, and his book, uh, or his books about that voyage were immensely influential on a lot of people. And uh, historian Ian McCalman uh, at the University of Queensland has argued that in addition to Darwin's famous voyage on the Beagle, there were three 19th century voyages in particular that were influential on the battle for the theory of evolution following the publication of The Origin of Species. Now, these were the voyages of Joseph Hooker, who uh, later ended up as the curator at Kew Gardens. He was a botanist. Darwin's bulldog. I really hate that phrase. Please don't use it. Wasn't used in his lifetime. Thomas Huxley, who um, in the voyage of the HMS Rattlesnake uh, circumnavigated Australia, uh, and he ended up marrying a Sydney girl once he'd made his fortune. And Alfred Russell Wallace. And I want to focus on Wallace in particular because he's a very interesting man and many of our views of nature do, uh, defer to him rather than to Darwin. So very briefly, Darwin's voyage uh, was a five-year voyage from December 1831 to October 1836. Uh, you can see here that he uh, visited um, South America, uh, famously the Gal Galapagos Islands in the Pacific, uh, I think he also went to Hawaii or uh, Tahiti, one of the two. Uh, New Zealand, he stopped off at the very top of the North Island. He went to Sydney and Hobart and um, uh, King George Sound, I think it is, in uh, Western Australia, uh, and then back home via uh, South Africa and um, um, some of the islands. Now. We will attend to Darwin in detail in one of the uh, days that we're going to look at. So I want to talk about Alfred Russell Wallace. Uh, that is how you spell his second name. His mother misspelled it on the, um, um, on the birth certificate. Despite what you might hear, he has not been forgotten at any point in the sciences. Darwin gets a lot of press, but um, we don't um, evaluate someone's importance by what the media decides to cover. Um, he was born in Wales to middle class parents, um, but was uh, forced to leave school at 13 when the family fell on hard times. He was still able to educate himself thanks to the libraries of mechanical institutes in his area. Mechanical institutes were um, sort of like tradesmen's uh, clubs or libraries, and, and uh, they would have lectures and uh, all of the latest books there. So you could actually educate yourself to some degree, even if you weren't wealthy. After working with his brother as a surveyor, he left for South America to work as a specimen collector for natural history museums to support himself as a naturalist. Uh, this was very common. Um, people could make a good living on their specimens, um, but it was a dangerous uh, thing to be doing. And his brother died of uh, uh, disease, I think, while they were going up the Amazon. When he was sailing home four years later, his ship caught fire and his collection was lost. He spent 10 days in an open life raft with only a parrot for company. I mean, <laughs> they made him tough back then. Fortunately, he was rescued and he had insured his collections. So he was able to live for a time and publish some scientific papers on the proceeds. At 31, he set off on a new voyage, this time to Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and New Guinea. This was a much more successful expedition than the one to Brazil. He discovered thousands of new species of beetle, and he sent over 100,000 specimens of various species back to the UK. He also observed a big change in animal life between two islands, one, Bali, and the other, Lombok and they are separated by a short stretch of water. This is now called the Wallace Line, and it marks um, 
a zone where Asian wildlife bumps up against Austronesian or Australasian wildlife. This is a map uh, of his journey from one of his um, uh, papers, and the red line I've put in there shows the Wallace line. Now, what's interesting about the Wallace line is that it's very deep water there, and um, consequently it's uh, dangerous water. Um, it's where basically the Austronesian plate hits the Eurasian plate. Um, on the one, on the right hand side, you have uh, um, marsupials and and uh, particular sorts of uh, snakes and, and lizards, and on the left hand side, you have pretty much the standard Eurasian uh, complement. For example, squirrels um, and and uh, big cats and the like. All right, so while Wallace was unwell because he contracted, as most Europeans did in that area, um, ma malaria, uh, he was uh, in his hut uh, being looked after by his local, uh, he employed a young boy, and no, there was no, no, no uh, pederasty going on here, no paedophilia. Uh, he... Uh, in fever dreams, came up with the idea of natural selection. And he wrote it down when he had sufficiently recovered. And he wrote, an antelope with shorter or weaker legs must necessarily suffer more from the attacks of the feline carnivora. The passenger pigeon with less powerful wings would sooner or later be affected in its powers of procuring a regular supply of food. If, on the other hand, any species should produce a variety having slightly increased powers of preserving existence, that variety must inevitably in time acquire a superiority in numbers. I'll let you read the rest of the quote in your own time. In what's one of the most famous and debated events in the history of modern science, Wallace sent the essay to Charles Darwin, with whom he had been regularly corresponding. Darwin had been working on a similar idea for 20 years, but as yet had not published. He was terribly anxious about that, and uh, his um, young son had just gotten ill and died. So um, he handed the essay to Charles Lyell, who I mentioned before, and Joseph Hooker, both of whom he had previously discussed his ideas on evolution by natural selection. Lyle and Hooker decided Wallace and Darwin's theory should be read at a meeting of the Linnaeus, Linnaean Society on July the 1st, 1858, and to establish priority, which Lyle and Hooker believed was uh, proper, Darwin should be read for. A year later, while Wallace was still in Indonesia, Darwin published his Origin of Species. Now, some people have suggested Darwin stole Wallace's ideas. Fred Hoyle, for example, proposed that Darwin although he had a huge amount of data, he had been unable to put it together in a satisfactory formulation. Most historians and biologists don't think this is true. And the thing that really makes it uh, unlikely from my perspective is even after Darwin died, uh, Wallace treated him with great respect and gratitude for having made his idea part of his theory. Um, an interesting question sometimes asked is how long would it have taken Darwin to publish his own theory of evolution if Wallace hadn't sent him his essay? And there's an interesting paper by uh, historian John Fan Wai, uh, who's at uh, National University of Singapore. Um, and John has argued that Darwin's delay had nothing to do with um, uh, not being able to, you know, formulate it, not being able to um, um, uh, deal with you know, the per perceived problems that would come from uh, publishing such a radical philosophy, uh, but rather that he was finishing off his um, um, bona fides, his, his, his qualifications by completing his volumes on uh, barnacles, which even today are still regarded as a major uh, reference work for barnacles. So uh, Darwin wanted to make sure that he got um, got his chops, that people could say he paid his dues, so to speak. Now back to Wallace. 
Um, Wallace encountered orangutans um, in a different environment and manner. Uh, Darwin encountered uh, a captive uh, orangutan at the uh, London Zoological Gardens. He was a member and was able to um, interact with the animals. But um, uh, it started him thinking about what was similar between orangutans and humans, at least emotionally and intellectually. Um, and just like Darwin, so too was um, um, Wallace. During his second and last uh, specimen collecting mission in 1855, Wallace sailed to Sarawak in Borneo, uh, ruled by a swashbuckling Englishman known as the White Raja, Sir James Brooke. Wallace stayed with him um, intermittently and uh, um, he later wrote, uh, uh, the British consul Spencer and John, later wrote a recollection of Wallace in Sarawak. We had at this time in Sarawak the famous naturalist, traveller and philosopher, Mr. Alfred Wallace, who was then elaborating in his mind the theory which was simultaneously worked out by Darwin, the theory of the origin of species. And if he could not convince us that, that our ugly neighbours, the orangutans, were our ancestors, he pleased, delighted and instructed us by his clever and inexhaustible flow of talk. Really good talk. The Raja was pleased to have so clever a man with him as it excited his mind and brought out his brilliant ideas. So upon Wallace's return to Britain, he a, found out that um, uh, Darwin had uh, mentioned him in The Origin of Species as coming up with the idea at the same time. Um, he was um, very proud of that fact. And he produced an extremely popular book called The Malay Archipelago, which provides a very good account of his travels around Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia. And there's some great illustrations made by professional artists based on his sketches. At one point he writes of sleeping soundly despite half a dozen smoke dried human skulls suspended over my head. There were still headhunters in those islands at the time. The book is dedicated to Darwin. Now it said that Conrad kept a copy on his uh, Joseph Conrad kept a copy on his desk and used it as an inspiration for his novel Lord Jim, which is the basis for the movie Apocalypse Now. A little bit of a historical uh, connection there. David Attenborough also said he read a copy as a schoolboy and it helped him and uh, inspire him to his career. So we have some amazing images. I'll just quickly go through them uh, of. Um, uh, various birds and um, uh, often these were his sketches but they're also often from photographs uh, or specimens and the book's interesting not only for his observations of nature but of the people and the place that he visited. For instance here is uh, a couple of uh, Timorese men from a photograph. Here are some of his beetles. <laughs> Um, late, years later, Richard Dawkins would remark that when we refer to Darwin's law of natural selection, we should really be calling it the Wallace-Darwin rule. In any case, Wallace himself never appears to have been uh, felt hard done by. And Darwin would campaign vigorously and successfully for Wallace to receive a state pension when Wallace and his family later fell on hard times. Wallace gave Darwin priority until his death 30 years after Wallace. All right, now the last section I want to talk about today is uh, the question of classification and collecting. And the person who we're going to focus on here is Carl Linnaeus. Um, he was a, a, a doctor who got into botany and as a result of his very good skills at getting specimens and organizing information. He uh, set up a taxonomic system, which we still call the Linnaean system. Um, and he became professor of botany at Uppsala University uh, in Sweden, uh, although he did a lot of his work in Holland while he was doing his PhD or doctoral thesis. I don't know what it was called. OK, he published in um, his book, The um, uh, Systema Naturae, which was first published in 1735. 
um, a hierarchy uh, of ranks. And he divided everything into kingdoms, classes, orders, genera, and species. So, consequently, in his book, humans are animals, we're in the kingdom animalia. We're mammals, we, we produce milk, so we are mammalia. We are primates, that is, in with apes and monkeys, uh, primata. And our genus is Homo, and our species is wise or rational sapiens. During the 19th century, the ranks of phylum and family were added, and new ranks have been added massively ever since. So Linnaeus knew that his classification scheme was, was partly natural, but he also knew that it was partly artificial. He did not think this necessarily told you about the way the world was organised, except insofar as things were related to each other. Uh, he once said that the genera and species are the mind of God, all else is the mind of man. So, the natural system, system of naturae, or system of nature is better, um, went through 13 editions, uh, 10 of which I think, or 12 of which, are in uh, Linnaeus' uh, lifetime. Um, and the 10th edition in 1758 is regarded as the first uh, authoritative naming system. So if, a, uh, if Linnaeus named something, that name takes priority on subsequent names. He had three kingdoms, the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, and the animal kingdom. So whenever anyone says to you, animal, vegetable, or mineral as a guessing game, this is where it comes from. Uh, the first group dealt with in the animal kingdom is primatus, uh, or primates, which is Latin for the first rank, in case you ever wondered why we're called primates. This is a couple of lectures on, I apologize for that. Um, is the political aspect of um, uh, classification and to do that I need to talk about a couple of things. So the period in which uh, uh, specimens uh, were being collected and classified, it had a strong imperial nature to it. For a start, um, most of these uh, collections ended up, uh, at least in the 19th century, in imperial museums. So there were museums for each of the empires, the um, um, uh, Museum Histoire Naturelle in, in Paris, British uh, Museum of Natural History, American Museum of Natural History, and so forth in New York. So th these were seen as um, uh, a central part of being a, an imperial power. But there's more to it than that. Um, the very nature of the um, classifications themselves were um, uh, political, right? So we talked about Linnaeus's uh, ranks. Um, so you start with um, kingdom, obviously political. You start with class. What well, could be more political than class? You have order. Uh, many of the political institutions at the time were orders of this or that, um, and so forth until you get down to um, uh, genus, which is a logical term. So at that point, um, you can see that there is a, an attempt to frame the world in political terms. Uh, not coincidentally, he was also given a knighthood and was funded by the Swedes. Swede, Sweden was a um, um, political empire at the time, not so much in the 19th century. Uh, he also used his status as the lead um, taxonomist to gain specimens from around the world. And uh, uh, in fact, it meant some sort of uh, social standing if your specimens were used by Linnaeus. But there were competing people in, in, in France and Germany who uh, were attempting to get them as well. So there was a kind of competitive social uh, aspect to it. Um, 
And Linnaeus' status and, and, and uh, both social or political and scientific meant that he had access to the whole kit and caboodle. One of his students was on Cook's voyage. Um, uh, others were sent into Siberia, into the boreal forests of Eurasia, uh, just everywhere. Okay. Now, the other thing about this was that Linnaeus used what he called the sexual system. Now, what's interesting about that is that um, sex was a very um, managed affair forgive the pun, uh, in Europe at the time. Uh, Linnaeus was in a Lutheran society. Uh, the Lutheran church was the state church and all Swedes had to uh, contribute to the Lutheran church whether they were members or not. Um, in the, uh, Southern Europe, uh, you know, France, Spain, Italy and so forth, the Catholic church was, uh, in, was dominant Germany was basically split half and half. Now, the use of uh, uh, the sexual system, which is the uh, parts of flowers that are um, important for reproduction. Um, it had only recently at that time been discovered that plants had sexes, although there are people who had been making that claim for some time. Uh, and if you have a look at the um, image there of the sexual system, uh, you will see that it's quite scandalous because you have females with one male, two males, three males, etc. Uh, you have, um, you know, brothers breeding with uh, females, just all over the place. And so as a result, it was put on the uh, index of prohibited books by the Catholic Church, which is um, uh, where um, scandalous books go to get um, their cachet among free thinkers. Basically, if you're uh, a bit of a rebel, then if it's on the prohibited books index, <laughs> you're going to read it. Now, there was much debate about this, and um, at the beginning of the 19th century, um, the idea that um, organisms, not just plants, but organisms were um, sexually, um, were sexual and therefore that was needed in order to uh, reproduce. Um, there were church people arguing that Linnaeus was wrong. Linnaeus was becoming very popular in Britain at the time. And um, here's Anna Seward, a romantic poet, and coincidentally a friend of Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, um, who uh, is pointing out that, you know, anyone who's in a farm knows that... Um, Animals, through, uh, you know, require sex to produce a, uh, their progeny and blah, blah, blah. All right. Now, Linnaeus' main innovation here was in naming things. This is technically known as nomenclature. Uh, and he replaced a multinomial nomenclature, that is, many words were used in the name to a simple system of two names, right? The binomial nomenclature, a genus and a species. I think of genus as the street name and species as the uh, street number. It's an address that gets you to that place. All right, so for an example, here is the tomato recently brought over from uh, um, the Americas which hadn't yet become um, a main um, food source because they thought it was poisonous until the Italians started putting it in everything. So prior to Linnaeus, we had basically a sentence, Solanum cala in army herbaceo folius pinatus uh, incisus. I have no idea what that means. My Latin's not that good, but... Um, uh, Linnaeus reduces that to the genus Solanum and the species 
Lycra persicum. You can see that it's a much more straightforward and simple, but more than that, you can use that as an index term. You can put it into a database. Right? You can have everything ordered neatly on cards, and in fact, Linnaeus did exactly that. He invented the uh, uh, card filing system in order to maintain uh, all of his things. And if he had to move a species from one genus to another, then it was just a matter of picking up that species card and putting it in a different grouping. But the one that everybody wants to know about are humans. Now, you'll remember that we were talking about um, uh, Wallace uh, trying to convince the uh, Raja of Sarawak that um, humans and uh, orangutans were quite closely connected. Uh, this was not unique or new to Wallace. The um, uh, initial uh, edition of the system in Aturai had uh, three species of the genus Homo, Homo sapiens, that's us, Homo troglodytes, which is probably um, uh, a kind of third or fourth hand um, uh, version of um, uh, you know, great apes in Africa, you know, sort of rumors, and Homo la, which uh, um, is the uh, smaller apes, probably. Now, what this means is that if Homo troglodytes did refer to chimpanzees, then according to the rules of primacy in classification, they should still be in the genus Homo. Uh, they're not, and there are reasons for that that are today scientific, but at the time there was no reason to distinguish them, and he didn't. And in fact, he got a lot of criticism from uh, uh, the Lutheran Church. So here's a, uh, a quote from a letter that he wrote um, after he'd been accused of impiety to uh, another botanist, Gemellen, uh, German. Uh, it is not pleasing that I placed humans among the primates, but man knows himself. Let us get the words out of the way. It will be the same to me by whatever name they are treated. But I ask you and the whole world a generic difference between men and simians in accordance with the principles of natural history. Now, he's playing a little game there because the principles of natural history that he's appealing to are the ones he himself has created. But notice also he wants a genus difference, generic. He wants um, there to be a reason to put these things into a different um, genus on the basis of um, um, you know, skeletal, structural, and so forth. And he says, I certainly know none. If only someone would tell me one. If I called man an ape or vice versa, I would bring together all the theologians against me. Perhaps I ought to, scientifically. Now, the thing about Linnaeus is he was a very devout Lutheran. But he had an attitude here that science trumped the sensibilities of theologians. So um, I think you've got to be really careful. A lot of people think that um, Linnaeus's views were based on um, uh, his religious uh, belief. Um, I think this shows that no, it's, it, his religious belief was something that had to accommodate scientific principles. In fact, apes were basically um, rejected by many of the European scientists and his Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, um, who as a student <clears throat> classified human races into the system that is now used in the United States and from which so much pain and misery has developed. Um, but he was disgusted at the idea that apes and humans should be uh, considered the same genus. And so he reclassified them into a genus Simia, which became Pan in, uh, later on. So we now have Pan troglodytes for the common chimp. Blumenbach is not just reacting to Linnaeus. He's reacting to a number of people, um, uh, in particular Rousseau, who we talked about last time, and um, um, uh, various other people, uh, Lord Monboddo in Scotland, 
uh, who had argued that the orangutan was an basically underdeveloped type of human. Um, and uh, this is something that persisted right into the 20th century. Plant species um, were defined by the uh, names given in uh, his, uh, Linnaeus's Species Plantarum, uh, which is his first work of botany in 1753. Now, um, what that means is that if a name has been given in uh, Linnaeus's book, it's um, something that you have to justify changing or reclassifying. So it's sort of like the beginning of nomenclature in botany. He also published a book in 1749, which is very directly relevant to us. This is the economy of nature, oikonomia naturae. This is probably the first um, text to explicitly define nature in terms of its economic interactions. Now, by that, I don't mean uh, the economy of trading or exploiting species. I mean that he started to look at how things interacted. He didn't do this particularly well. Uh, he was a muse museum guy. He, he, he did a bit of uh, local work uh, in, in um, uh, Sweden and particularly up in the Sami regions of Sweden. But because um, you'll see uh, pictures of him wearing Sami dress and so forth. Um, but he at least looked at the arrangement of species and how they interacted with each other. And this is possibly the first work in science uh, that starts to talk about ecology, although the term ecology isn't um, coined until quite a bit later. His students went everywhere in the world. You can see here the voyages, uh, you know, voyages through Europe, uh, Eurasia, voyages through the Pacific, um, voyages to uh, parts of Africa and so on. So this is definitely part of the, all, the whole uh, voyages of discovery. So why was Linnaeus's system so useful? Well, first of all, it helped with the management of an increasingly uh, larger uh, data set. Uh, there were more and more specimens coming in, more and more uh, uh, samples, um, and this gave um, this set up a problem which previously had been able to be dealt with by just listing everything alphabetically. But of course that doesn't help if you uh, want to know what sort of a thing something is. So he's now got the genus and the species. So you can gather all the species into a genus, you can gather all the genera into a, uh, a, a class or order, I forget which is the next one up. Um, and it's simple to use and revise a system that way. As I said, uh, he invents databases on cards. <laughs> uh, it's very useful for trade, especially trade in horticulture. Now that's uh, not agriculture, that's plants for gardens and uh, flowers. This is the period in history when the French and later the British become garden crazy. Um, and so they need to ha have a way to identify the plants that they're importing from their empires into these large gardens. We'll get back to that. His system was introduced into Britain by Andreas Solander, who was the um, person who accompanied Joseph Banks on um, uh, Cook's voyage. And Sir James Edward Smith, a leading botanist in Britain, um, uh, in, uh, supported this and we ended up with um, uh, the Linnean Society and then for some reason they didn't call it the Linnaean Society um, after his works had become basically uh, the standard go-to texts and uh, Smith acquired Linnaeus's collection after he died there's a story that the uh, King of Sweden sent a galleon to chase the ship 
that had these uh, this collection across the North Sea. I think that's apocryphal. Um, uh, and, and it's just one of those lovely stories that people like to tell to uh, um, make it all seem very exciting in kids' books particularly. All right. But Linnaeus didn't have it all his own way. Oh, of course, he was dead by this stage. Um, there were people, particularly in the French and German-speaking worlds, which rejected the system. So here's one. Uh, he's rather important. We'll come back to uh, Buffon. Uh, the Comte de Buffon, in other words, the Count of Buffon. Uh, he's just referred to as Buffon. He's got a very long name. We'll come back to it. He rejected it because it was an artificial system. That is, it was something that was developed for convenience uh, rather than to capture the way the world was. And Linnaeus admitted this. He tried, a, uh, tried to create a um, uh, natural system of his own and failed, as did everybody else who tried. Um, but, um, uh, you know, there's a bit of an unfair criticism. The other thing was that Buffon pointed out that if you use different characters rather than flowering uh, fractative apparatuses, apparati, um, that um, you got different groups. And that's very true. Uh, and Buffon had a problem which characters to use. And we'll come back to that when we start to talk about evolution. So we're sort of weaving lots of you know, threads together. Uh, and it's a bit unfair on you because you have to maintain all these in your head until we get to the payoffs. Anyway, that's it for today. I've put a couple of uh, references there. Um, please, as always, um, ask questions, disagree, argue, um, query whether I've got it right because I can do things wrong, uh, and uh, I'll see you in the lecture in the tutes. Cheers.